So another way that we could actually simplify these truss problems is understanding the idea of symmetry. So I'm going to draw a diagram that we've seen before, like a house kind of structure. So something looks like this. Let's say this is that. And then we have something that looks like that. There's something that looks like that. And there's a bar going along this direction. And what I'm going to say, there's an applied force. So I call that, I'll call that force A. There's an applied force, which we'll know. That's usually given in the problem, the applied forces. And then there's a reaction force here. Um, we call this F1 and F2. So, if or F, F2, not F3. So, um, as you can see, this, this um, diagram is actually pretty symmetric. And what defines symmetry is that there's this line or this axis of symmetry that allows us to mirror different portions of the diagram onto another portion of the diagram. And those mirrors actually overlap each other. And uh, if that does happen, then we have this symmetric problem. So this one's kind of obvious. The line of symmetry or the axis of symmetry lies directly right here. So you could imagine maybe folding a piece of paper along this line, and you'll notice that this, uh, this portion of the diagram will overlap this portion of the diagram. And let's say there's a joint there. And uh, that's a very good, good signal that this problem is symmetric. However, um, what also determines symmetry is that the forces actually are symmetric as well, meaning uh, not only do they line up when you fold up, fold this paper or fold a, about this line, but it's also important that they're equal in magnitude. So um, a very basic way to explain that, since this diagram is actually symmetric, is that we could take this distance here. It doesn't matter what distance it is, as long as that the distance, or as long as this line of symmetry is symmetric, we could say this arbitrary distance for the, of these forces that they interact with along this line, we could say that the sum of the moments about, let's say this point um, Q, the sum of the moments about Q, we'll define this side as positive, we could say that F1 is uh, negative times D, and then we could say F2 times D, and for this structure to be equilibrium, we have to set it equal to zero. So by solving this equation, we could simply say that F1D equals F2D, and we could simply say that F1 equals F2. And that's just analyzing the whole structure by itself without exploding it into different two force members. So now that we know this force and this force are actually equal to each other, um, we could say that this problem is symmetric. Now you may be asking, what about this force A? Since this force A is actually lying along the axis of symmetry, when it gets mirrored, it doesn't really move anywhere. It stays along this line of symmetry. I mean, you could try doing it yourself. Imagine folding a paper along this axis, and, this, and you look at the force, the displacement of this force from its original position, it's actually going to stay in the same spot. So although um, there's no counteracting force with this, um, there is, it, it is properly mirrored when you fold this diagram about itself. And uh, so this force is actually symmetric in this diagram. So you may be asking, what's the importance of symmetry then? Uh, the importance of symmetry is that you basically half, you could solve the problem half the time without... Um, doing or you're basically doing half the work and that's simply because let's say you have uh, uh, you define this uh, member and you figured it out that this member is actually in compression so we'll draw the forces going in that direction and once you know the forces on this side of the diagram what that means is that the forces acting on this side of the diagram are equal to the mirrored image. So we could say that these four, this member right here is actually in um, compression as well and pointing in the same or, or, or have the same magnitude as the forces here. And then we can actually repeat this process. So if this is actually in um, tension, so this is getting pulled then we could say that this member right here is actually getting pulled as well. So we could say that is going in that direction and in that direction. 
and we basically repeat this process. So let's say this is actually in um, tension as well. So this will be going upward, and then this will be an up uh, going downward. That means this member over here must be going upward and downward. And ba uh, these forces um, actually equal each other, corresponding to the mirrored image. So let's say, so once you find the magnitude of this uh, compressive force, it's the same thing for this member right here. And then if you find the magnitude of this or ten tensile force, then that's the same as this member right here. And then the same for this and this. So that basically saves half the time when solving these problems. So now that you have the idea of symmetry and zero force members and the method of joints, you should be able to solve trusses, trust problems quite simply. Although this is still robust, there's actually another way to solve trusses more quickly if you're looking at only one force or one member. Like let's say you don't want to analyze this whole structure, you just want to know whether this bar or this two force member is in tension or compression. There is still another way that is a lot faster that allows you to solve basically only for this or a limited amount of free body diagrams to solve for whether or not this is intention or compression. And we'll get to that in the future. But understand the ideas of symmetry and zero force members. If you understand those two things, trust problems become a lot simpler and a lot, time, a lot more time efficient. So recognize symmetry and zero force members when it comes to trust problems.